check one, two. Can you hear me on the live stream? Ooh, gotta update that stream info. saxophones of our theme song sax by mdb Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Word Hack. Really excited to have you here with us this evening. Hey, how's it going? I'm, I'm Todd Anderson. I'm your host this evening. Really excited to have you with us. Uh, if this is your first time here, Word Hack is a monthly show. It started at, at Baby Castles almost eight years ago. Uh, and in, uh, yeah, in 2014. And it's a monthly show dedicated to exploring the intersection of language and technology. So how computers, phones, e-readers, uh, websites, how these all change the way we read and write and think about language. And uh, lots of people come to that from different ways and use language in, to different degrees. We have writers who use it, uh, uh, who use programming as part of their writing practice. Uh, we have linguists who use code to study language. We have digital artists who have language as part of their uh, practice. Game makers uh, coming up with new forms of procedural storytelling or dialogue engines. All kinds of people. And it really, first and foremost, WordHack is a kind of open and welcoming space for all the different people that come to these you don't need don't need to be part of a special group or have a special accreditation to be be part of word hack you can just kind of show up and uh and uh participate and be part of things um but kind of how we how we run things here is we'll usually have between two and four talks that are about 15 to 20 minutes long from uh from different presenters uh and uh then to to start things off We'll have uh, the open projector as well, so I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that in a second. Um, but I, oh, I'm going to turn off my scrolling text. Okay, great. Um, but uh, yeah, we usually start things off with uh, um, with an open projector, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, our, our featured presenters this evening, uh, we're joined by the amazing Melanie Hoff. And then we'll be having a presentation of Moon Dungeon from myself and Bryant Smith. So let's give it up for our featured presenters. Please clap. Oh, yeah. Oh, Katie's showing us how it's done. Word Hack has its roots in baby castles in either a small gallery space or a tiny basement space. 
a uh, place where you can really feel the audience right up next to the performer. And we like to try and create that feeling as much as we can, uh, maybe less the sweating on top of each other, but the feeling of being able to hear and feel the presence of the audience in the, in the chat. Um, so when someone's coming up on stage, when someone's finished presenting, or even when there's just like a moment where it seems appropriate during uh, a presentation, uh, say something in chat, let people know, give a, give a clap, give a cheer, give a fire emoji. Um, just kind of uh, let, let people know that you're there. And uh, part of the, the, the feel of this event, the performer can feel you there and you can feel each other there responding to things. That's, a, that's really part of, a, of how we do things here, here at WordHack. Um, but yeah, the, before we get to our featured presenters, we're going to have our open projector. So open projector, it's a word hack tradition. It's been, every single word hack has had one. It's a, uh, kind of like an open mic. It's a, uh, a space to present work for five minutes each at the start of the show. But, uh, my background is in poetry. And so going to poetry open mics when I first moved to New York city, uh, what is it, uh, maybe 12 years ago, uh, was really important for me and be able to kind of meet other artists, integrate myself into a creative community. And I think poetry generally does a really good job of that as opposed to other arts communities of like being really open in that way and, uh, and allowing people to get up and read something and, uh, and share and like uh, as part of something else rather than not necessarily having it as its own separate event. But I love the idea of just starting an event with a little open area for some new people to to enter the mix. And uh, with Open Projector, I really wanted to create that kind of opportunity for more digital sorts of projects. So that's what we, we do here at the top of the show. So we've got three people signed up who are going to be presenting for, for five minutes on stream. Uh, I'll, I'll keep time for you presenters and I'll, I'll, I'll gracefully enter to let you know when you're when you're at time. Um, but yeah, they're they're really excited uh, by our presenters. I think all of our presenters this evening are uh, people that have presented at WordHack in some capacity before. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean people can, you need to know someone or I need to tap you to be on the open projector. Uh, if any of the things you see up here, it's like, oh, I could I could come up and show something in that in that same way. Yes, you could, and I hope you'll join us on a future one. Um, so let's get those uh, get those applause hands ready and warmed up for our our first our very first open projector presenter of the night a returning celebrated open projector performer uh please give it up for Erdemas give it up for Erdemas Hi, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Uh, wait a sec. Uh, uh, can you see my Google Slides? Yes. Okay. Oh, wait a sec. Um, going to do this. Uh, hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Herdimas. I'm Indonesian. I'm new media artist. I'm currently teaching at uh, Virginia Tech, and I'm going to teach at uh, VCU next fall semester. Um, and yeah, I'm going to start with my uh, presentation. But let me wait a sec. There's supposed to be like a like a title page, but well, hmm, sorry. <laughs> um, and then wait a sec. Um, uh, sorry, I should have like tested this before, but <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, everyone. Um, yeah, I see click to add title. Click to add title. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, what a sec. Um, hmm. I don't really know what's going on. What a sec. I'm so sorry, I don't know what's going on.
But breaking the software, to, breaking which software custom, to which we are accustomed, to, to, to the extent to which, which, we, are to which we are conditioned by the media, I can glitch our digital tools, in fighting, tools people in, fighting people in fighting people the modes of engagement, with technology. Of engagement with technology. In a world in which computer, in a world networks, in which computer have networks, have networks, have networks, networks have become an extension of capitalist and state control, in which bodies and labor are continuously converted into data, I'm hoping that my digital dances invite unruly resistance. Thank you. So much of the mouth. That was fantastic. Beautiful visual arts and amazing, amazing performance and theatrics and and code as always. Thank you so much, Eridamas. Great to have you back. All right. Oh man, we've got some some great emojis here in the chat. Um, oh yeah, cultural semiotics too for sure. Um, all right, let's move on to our next presenter. Really excited to have back with us at WordHack, Katie Garrow. Let's give it up for Katie. Hey, okay, let me share my screen and pick the right one. All right. Um, so I'm going to present on like a work in progress or something that just started that I've tentatively be calling the shadow poems or maybe like data sets for no one. Um, as a slight sidebar, I've been collecting like different magazines that publish or like promote things like computational poetry where you can like submit your work. And I'll drop a link in the chat because I think, I don't know, it's been really cool to like learn about all these different venues. Um, and if you're like interested in engaging in like computational poetry as like a literary magazine community, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. And if people like know stuff I'm missing, I'd love to add it. So I'll put that in the chat in a second oh, that'd be great. or at the end. Um, but so the shadow poems or data sets for no one. Um, so my day job, I'm a computer scientist and I feel like a lot of what we do as computer scientists is like collect data sets that other people care about and wanna use. That's kind of like a big thing in research. Um, and I got kind of interested in maybe like collecting a data set that I'd like never want anyone to see ever and I'd never wanna share. Um, as maybe rebelling a bit against what I have to do all the time for my job. And so I have been trying to collect a data set of like private journaling or like shitty first drafts or basically like things that I've written that I would never want to show anyone. And so you might think, why would you want to do this thing that sounds um, a little miserable? Uh, it kind of scares me to think of like having to like go through all these things that are very private. Um, and I'm often attracted to things that I find really scary. Um, I also want to use it to train a model that where I can kind of talk to myself. So I've been calling it the shadow poems because I'm like, if I were to train a model on like these personal private thoughts of mine, obviously it wouldn't be me, but maybe it could represent some part of me that would be useful to see. So I, I like this idea of like asking it questions about me and it might like know it know something that I've never told anyone before. Um, and there's also an interesting technical constraint of like not wanting to ever let anything leave my local machine because I don't want ever, anyone to ever see this data ever. I'm like even kind of scared to look at it myself sometimes. So I have started collecting this data set right now. It's three things. Um, one is a set of like notes. So I use a notes app for drafting poems and essays and also like job applications and other letters and stuff um and then i've been looking for like long-ish outgoing emails so kind of like let, basically like letters that i've written to friends and then um this other set that i call like the silent letters so sometimes i use like email drafts as ways to kind of journal so i'll like write an email a really like personal email to someone that i know i'm never gonna send so this is like effectively very private journaling and i use my drafts like box to do so. And so this comes to about three megabytes of text, which isn't a lot, um, but it's not nothing. And 
it's just like incredibly private. And so I started training some language models on this incredibly private um, data set and it hasn't worked very well so far. So I don't know if I need more data or maybe I'm doing like, and I'm not making good modeling choices. Um, it's kind of started to learn how to talk, but not really. So the first, I've been calling them like my shadow poems reads the same and the same, I were be this ocean, I and is. So, you know, it's kind of, it's coming alive, but this is like clearly it's baby form. Um, for the off hen, I, and we, and other we people. Um, my, my second attempt was a little bit more data as I started collecting my emails. Um, Sigh, it's me, which is a little spooky, um, of a bee and the ocean is the, so ocean must be something I talk about a lot, and the they, w, the, the ocean. So it's, it's in its primal form, um, but I'm excited to kind of um, interact with myself through this project. Um, and there's some interesting technical details. I've been trying to like train all these models using like my M1 Apple laptop. Uh, so I kind of have access to a GPU. Um, but yeah, it's just, I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, and also like really scared of like doing this uh, documentation that I hope uh, maybe I'll destroy at the end. All right. And yeah, and I'll drop the, the places to um, for computational poetry in the chat. That's all I got. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Katie. Very cool. I really love that as a, as a concept. And uh, also, thank you for those places to submit and various kinds of electronic writing. It's always good to, good to see those in, in one place. I know, like, when I was in my, like, first year or two of making digital writing stuff, I just did not know about anywhere where you could do stuff. And it's nice to see that more places have uh, have popped up over, over time. Very cool. All right. And uh, here to, to close out our open projector, please give it up for Jamie Brew. Welcome, Jamie. Hello. Can you see me? Yes. Oh, I can see myself in your screen. That's great. <laughs> I am very lucky to be going after Katie uh, because I wanted to use this open projector spot to announce the launch of another uh, place where you can submit in a way uh, computational writing. Uh, I'll share my screen so I can explain more. And after this presentation, I will uh, badger Katie to try to get included on that list, that directory of places. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna keep it on this non-presenting mode because I'll be switching tabs, but I want to present on the first issue upcoming of the cookingflavor.com quarterly review. Um, this name will be explained in a couple slides. Uh, the origin of the cookingflavor.com quarterly review is last month, Janelle Shane on her blog, AI Weirdness, posted about a blog that a reader had sent to her uh, called cookingflavor.com. Uh, it seems to be, though no one really knows for sure, a, uh, a project where every day hundreds of articles generated from real seeming questions by presumably GPT or one of its ilk of language generation models, uh, hundreds of articles answering questions for every minute of the day, every day. Uh, we should visit cookingflavor.com to get a sense of what this looks like. Um, the homepage is just a list of questions which we can infinitely scroll through 
until we find a question we want to know more about. Do goosebumps make hair grow? And in this case, it has a very terse answer. Goosebumps make hair grow. Sometimes some scientists believe that the salt and sweat on our skin keep the hair gr cells growing and dividing. The hair can become thicker and longer if it has enough hair cells. And so there's there's thousands of these. I think now thousands per day. Um, and since Janelle brought this to my attention, I have been keeping up with cookingflavor.com and curating a selection of my favorite articles and my favorite questions from within those articles, as there are often sub-questions within the cookingflavor.com articles and uh, putting it together into a publication that I intend to release at some point called the cookingflavor.com quarterly review, a web magazine dedicated to curating and showcasing the finest writing on cookingflavor.com, this SEO optimization farm, uh, which endlessly answers probably Google questions. We don't really know what the source of these questions is. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that it is taking commonly asked questions on Google and spinning up articles that respond to those. So what I'd like to do today in my remaining time is preview some of issue one, summer 2022 of the cookingflavor.com quarterly review. Uh, we can, I just wanna show you that you can click through on each of these links and get to the actual article on cookingflavor.com. Uh, this one is called Why Are Cows Mooing at Night? And yeah, I guess I'm just gonna keep reading until I run out of time. So why are cows mooing at night? May 14th, 2022. Cows are mooing at night because their stomachs are empty and they are trying to find food. Why does a cow keep mooing? The cow keeps mooing because it is trying to communicate with its herd. Mooing is a Morse code communication and it is used to ask for help. The cow is also trying to show its herd that it is still the leader. Why do cows moo like crazy? Cows moo like crazy because they are trying to get their milk out of the cow's stomach. The cow's stomach is a large four chamber organ that is located in the lower part of the cow's body. The milk that the cow produces is stored in the cow's stomach until it is needed. Why are the cows making so much noise? The cows are making so much noise because they're making milk. Uh, I'm gonna skip some of these questions and go down to, what does it mean if a cow moves at you? It means you're a cow and you like to be around people. I think that's all we'll do for why are cows moving at night. Um, I have excerpted some of them directly into the, the presentation so we don't have to search through them like that for the rest. Why Pythagoras is important. And sub question, why Pythagoras is the first philosopher? Pythagoras was the first philosopher because he was the first to specifically mention the concept of time in his philosophy. He believed that time is the only thing that exists and that everything else is just a figment of our imagination. This was a major breakthrough in philosophy because it shifted the focus from things that can be measured to things that can't be measured. <laughs> what does surfboard mean? What does the surfing emoji mean? The surfing emoji is a pictograph that stands for the letter S and is used to indicate that the user is surfing the internet. The emoji is often used as a reaction to various text messages, including but not limited to questions, comments, and alerts. Where do farts go in the air? Subquestion, why is my fart so stink? There are many reasons for why people's farts smell bad. Some people say that it is because of all the bacteria that is in their gut. Others say that it's because of the 64 CO2 in the air, but the most likely reason is that something is cooking in their intestines. And the last one I'd like to read today is, whose slogan is have it your way? Sub question, what is Burger King current slogan? Quote, you know, the place where you can get anything you want and it's always fresh. What is Taco Bell's slogan? Quote, Taco Bell is the best place to have Mexican food. What is Chick-fil-A slogan? Chick-fil-A slogan is a slogan that is typically used by the company Chick-fil-A. The slogan is, I will always love you. Does Burger King have a jingle? Burger King has a jingle that goes, you're not as big as you think you are. The jingle is about how people's expectations can sometimes be too high. 
What is Google's slogan? Google's slogan is search the world, find what you want. The company originated as a search engine company, but has since become a mainstay in search and advertising. What is RV's slogan? We've got the best burgers in town. What is Wendy's catchphrase? Wendy's catchphrase is, I'm not your mom, but I'm pretty close. It's a slogan that she uses to attract attention and to make herself seem more confident. What is Coca-Cola's slogan? Coca-Cola is the world's most popular soft drink. What is Chipotle's slogan? Chipotle's slogan is the best way to eat Mexican. So that's the uh, preview of the inaugural issue of the cookingflavor.com quarterly. If you have submissions, which must be articles or excerpts of articles directly from cookingflavor.com, any subdomain is fine. Uh, you can send them to me directly at jamie at botnik.org. And I will now go pester Katie to see if I can, uh, to see if I can submit my submission portal. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Give it up for Jamie Brew. cookingflavor.com quarterly review that's cookingflavor.com oh man i i really try to not mute myself during people's presentations because uh i am so bad about unmuting myself but it's very hard not to just be laughing into the mic uh, <laughs> when Chick-fil-A's slogan is, I will always love you. It just really gets me. Uh, thanks so much, Jamie. And let's give it up one more time for all of the presenters on our open projector. Oh, yeah. Amazing work. Glad to have you share it with us. And we are ready to welcome our first featured presenter here. Uh, very excited to have Melanie Hoff with us this evening. Uh, Melanie is an artist, educator, and organizer. Um, her work uh, deals with the role of technology and how it uh, upholds uh, social hegemonic structures. Um, I work with her as the uh, as a co-director. Uh, where she is a co-director of the School for Poetic Computation, and uh, she's also involved with Soft Surplus and the Cybernetics Library. Please give a warm word hack welcome for Melanie Hoff. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And you can see my ASCII screen? Yes. Amazing. Hello, everyone. My name is Melanie Hoff, and as Todd mentioned, I am an artist, an educator, an organizer, and one of the places that I do that is the School for Poetic Computation, which I am proud to be a co-director of alongside Todd Anderson, Celine Katzman, Netta Bomani, Zay Aliu, American artist, and Galen McDonald. I am an artist that came, uh, an artist and programmer that came from a background of traditional arts education and then found myself in code spaces, uh, partly because of something that Todd mentioned earlier about what he liked about the poetry community, that it's a, a very open place for new people trying to share their work, share their ideas with, the, with each other. And I actually didn't find that really in, in traditional fine arts education or in um, traditional coding communities. But I, uh, like Todd, um, have found them despite that. <laughs> and um, 
what something that I was thinking about of uh, words to describe myself in addition to artist, educator, organizer, I might describe myself as a learner and I might also describe myself as a believer. Because I believe, I believe in a lot of things and one of them is that it is possible to create the communities that you never experienced. And so thank you Todd for inviting me here to uh, one of those places that you've created. And um, I am also a, a co-owner, co-director of a shared warehouse space in uh, Bushwick East Williamsburg alongside Shar Styles in the chat. Shout out to Shar and Andres Cuervo. Um, it is called Hex House, FKA Soft Surplus, formerly known as. And um, one thing about the communities that I find myself in and the kind of art practice that I find myself developing is that in my uh, background of before joining, before trying to do traditional fine art in college and then code in grad school, um, I didn't do school at all. And I especially didn't do writing. <laughs> so it's kind of funny to find myself uh, in a roundabout way, uh, creating and running a school and working with the computational poetry. Uh, somehow I found myself exactly in the place that I ran away from. So hello, my name is Melanie Hoff and this is a way that, um, I can see my present one second. Okay, so my name is Melanie Hoff, and this is one way that I am perceived by a large system of social organization, namely the US government and the New York State Department of Motor Vehicles. I think a lot about the ways that large system of opera of um, large system of naming and knowing structure and operationalized ourselves and our identities, our relationships and our belief systems. My name is Melanie Hoff and this is every single file on my computer arranged in a hierarchical tree showing their full file path. As a person that spends a lot of time online and an artist that makes a lot of work with their computer, I like to introduce myself by laying this bare and showing you in the most literal way, the contents of my bodily extension, my computer, a place I have worked hard to find home in. I'm interested in large systems of social organization and how these systems are encoded. This encoded happens digitally, socially, and legally. How do codes, structures, categorization, and language both harm and hold us, both fail and free us? In my work, I cultivate understanding, desire, pleasure, and celebration as sources of purpose and knowledge. In my work as an educator and friend, I care about affirming and expanding the ways people are already adept at understanding and changing their environments. I work with software, local network protocols, garlic farming, relational, economic, and performative social exchanges. How can we use technology to transform spaces of historical harm and neglect into spaces of healing and joy? I try to explore deep, intimate, and responsible ways of being and coding in subcultural third spaces, in the peripheries of the tech world, in the peripheries of the traditional uh, higher education world, in unknown spaces of what I can dream that has not yet been realized. Uh, one thing that I hold dear as a, a person, as an artist, and as a friend is that our practice can be about what we want to bring to us. I think I, I learned early on once I, the first time I ever made work that received any attention, I paid attention to what that attention was and I learned that I wasn't interested in that in people coming to talk to me about that thing. So I I offer that as an invitation for any people in their various modes of creative practicing that a, being an artist is a is a way to invite what you want to become into your world and to invite people who are also on a similar journey to become closer to you. And I'm um, 
Yeah, I'm really honored that I get to do some of that through my organizing and teaching work. Um, throwback to 2004, my introduction to art and politics and community as being inseparable, both something I did not want to separate, politics, community, and art, and something that I knew I could not separate began in middle school when I was in a Riot Girl crust punk band called The Pocliticals, as in the political clits. <laughs> um, we were existed all through middle school and high school. Riot Girl asks, what if the punk music we listened to, the music that called for social change, was made by people who shared similar histories of gender depression and socialization. And I have asked the same question of code and language itself. This past year, I have been thinking a lot about whether harm can be divorced from failure and the catalyzing force of collapse. In other words, I ask whether beautiful transformation oops, in other words, I ask whether beautiful transformation and collective renewal is possible without being preceded by catastrophe. And I'll now switch my presentation style and start presenting from my browser, beginning with a project that is currently installed at the Queens Museum called Failure, Failure Collapse Catalyze. Sure, I'm gonna switch the screen that it's sharing from. Okay. Failure, collapse, categorize, cat catalyze. Divorce, harm from failure. This project is a folder poem. These structures are folders on an Apache web server, and the website is structured using the default index page of Apache servers. Clicking through each su successively nested folder builds the poem. At the end of each poem that gets built in the URL itself, by nature of the structure of websites and Apache web servers. The poem ends by choosing a seed word from that folder tree branch of the poem to recursively search synonyms for. In other words, collapse is a synonym of failure. Yield is a synonym of collapse. Catalyze is a synonym of yield. Generate is a synonym of catalyze. Produce is a synonym of cattle of um, generate, it's produce, for, yeah, so yeah, becomes, you get it. Beautiful transformation and collective renewal preceded by catastrophe. Learning as a proxy to learn other things. Gender is power. This project I'm exploring what we can piece together in the explicit structure, the the explicit laid bare structure of language itself to find history, to find lines of power, to find histories of naming and knowing and creating understanding, which is everything. So, um, Todd, can I get a time check? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, you, you've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Perfect, thank you. 
So in, um, so in my educational work, which I have done um, most extensively at SFPC, the School for Product Computation, as well as other places like NYU, Pioneer Works, uh, Rhode Island School of Design, um, and Rutgers, I consider my classes as educational experiments, uh, almost as social experiments. I consider my classes as temporary schools in and of themselves, a collection of students and stewards, a learning society in meshed and coded systems. This is a class called Cybernetics of Sex, Technology, Feminisms, and the Choreography of Control. Cybernetics is the study of how we shape and are shaped by systems. What can it teach us about the ideological and sexual reproduction of gender and sexism? How does sex become gender and what are the politics surrounding who gets reproduced? This is a class called Digital Love Languages. This class is an ode to my to uh, a collective experience of COVID-19 and the pandemic. The first uh, was the, had held the theme of codes of affirmation and really explored what it meant to learn together online, deep in a global experience of quarantine and express express like intimate emotions and um, our own histories with computation as something that traditionally has so many of us have only bought and not made for ourselves. So how can we cultivate a more loving relationship with it, um, with each other, between us and our comp own intimate computing devices, as well as across distance, and especially thinking about those who we are quarantined apart from. The second time I taught it, it was under the theme of sensory commons. This class was in person. It was the first moment, the first breath of a possibility where people could actually be in close proximity together. And I thought about what does it mean? What are we afforded by being able to share physical space with each other while we explore intimate um, intimacies through computation, through networked protocols? Sensory commons for me is a term that I think that I um, apply to the idea of of a sense of uh, experiences where the distinction between your body and another's body becomes less important, and it's like a pool of sensation, like at a rave or when you're having a sleepover, like just sleep when you and your friend and your other friend and your other friend are all asleep in the same space together. It does, it's not important where your one body ends and the other begins. It's not as important. And uh, it's, uh, a choir is another example of, of sensory comments for me. It's like um, um, a group of people all expressing vibrations throughout their, their throat and those vibrations vibrating their own body and the hitting the bodies of those around them. Meanwhile, the other the, um, vocal expressions and vibrations of those around them all like combining and then it, it sort of becomes this like swirl of vibrations of uh, singing. Yeah, I'm very into choirs. <laughs> so that was sensory commons. And then most recently I taught it as um, under the theme of communion, consent, refusal, renewal. And this was very much tied to the themes I was exploring in the failure, collapse, catalyze poem. And digital, so digital love languages, communion, consent, refusal, renewal is an introductory com computing class for reimagining the core of technology's purpose. This class is based on the premise that there is a world where all of our software is made by people who love us and that we can contribute to building it. In this class, we have contributed to building it. It's not just a, an exercise in dreaming and fantasy. It is 
an exercise in creating that reality because as soon as we dream it, we learn to code. Many of us learn to code for the first time. And in this, this time I taught it, there were actually a lot of professional software developers. So for them, it wasn't an experience of learning to code. And then as if learning to code was always already taught as a creative writing tool, as a love letter writing tool, as a tool to get to know yourself more intimately, like Katie's project uh, demonstrated. Um, for the professional software developers, it was a, it was more even or from a different way, like a, an experience of unlearning, of, of applying, hey, like this thing that I'm, I'm very skilled at, what if I was making only the things that I that that felt that meant something to me that was not um, that didn't have to scale that wasn't oriented towards pro profit margins in any stretch of the imagination. Digital love language is an is an experiment in computational communion disguised as a class. We learn about things as a proxy to learn about other things. We learn about digital coding to question how we're socially coded. We learn about digital consent to question what we know about sexual consent. We learn about network protocols and remote access to learn about an intimate astral projection, which I'll talk about later, uh, right after this in this talk. Um, we talked about how encoding, naming as a force of knowledge production is so important. We learned about naming to learn about knowing. We learned about learning to learn about living. And in this class, I'm very proud to say that we cover five different programming languages, uh, which for many in the class, not all, but many, it is five of their first programming languages. So that's, um, this was a, a graphic thinking about the relationship uh, between communion, consent, refusal, and renewal that Galen made, a participant in the class and a co-director at SFPC that, um, Communion is the goal. So communion is like the 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 uh, like glowing the bold, the more bold like part. Communion is the goal for for to, for there to be communion. We must uh, co collectively practice consent for consent to be valid. There must be the possibility of refusal, and for consent and refusal to be in in good relation with each other, we must always renew that decision. And this is a class that I just launched today, Sex Ed. So I, um, I'll ask Todd to drop the link in the chat or I'll do it at the end of um, my presentation uh, so you can read more about it there. But I'm really excited to announce today uh, that the School for Product Computation um, presents Sex Ed. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, it's uh, I'm really excited. Um, let's see. It is a pleasure and queer centered experiment in shared study and epistemic empowerment. At SFPC Sex Ed, we believe pleasure is knowledge and its study is sacred. Like the School for Product Computation, SFPC Sex Ed is about unlearning harmful social programming of traditional educational environments as much as it is about art and code. We welcome you to, to participate in this program. Okay, so I'm gonna end my uh, word hack presentation to talk about an exercise, a learning, um, like almost like, it's like a capsule workshop that I have taught in cybernetics of sex, as well as digital love languages. And I'm not sure if I'll teach it in sex ed, but because it requires uh, learning uh, how to navigate the terminal and I, sex ed, I'm focusing it more on sex ed and less on like coding skills. But anyways, um, consensual hacking is, um, is a learning exercise. And yeah, it's a learning exercise and many other things. And uh, it is a vulnerable space of cooperation and trust. Consensual hacking is a guided activity where people carefully and consensually enter one another's personal computers remotely. 
What is social and digital consent and how are they interwoven? What does it mean to responsibly give and take access and control to our most intimate digital spaces? In other words, if you've heard of the, word, the term SSH, then you know what the term hacking into the mainframe means. So when you've ever heard someone say, oh, I'm ha I hacked into the mainframe, or even just I hacked, often what they mean is that they SSH, which is a secure shell networking protocol that happens through the computer's terminal. And what we do is uh, in this class, I have done it um, multiple ways. So when I did it IRL uh, in person, I had people in pairs, face-to-face, -face, laptop back-to-back, each person uh, entered and signed a social contract, which I'll show in a second, uh, where they outlined the conditions under which they would enact this exercise. And this exercise involves um, logging in to each other's computer through the terminal while sitting face-to-face -face, laptops back-to-back. -back. So if you can kind of think about this as a physical and abstract diagram. It, it's as if two laptops go, be, turn inside out and become the other one. Because from the terminal's perspective, the laptop you're looking at is actually the one of the, your partners ac across from you. And from their computer's terminal, their terminal becomes your computer. And full, uh, full remote control of each other's computers is um, activated. And this is a form of astral projection as seen in figure 7.1 of a uh, computing textbook that I once came across in the cybernetics library. Consensual hacking asks, is there pleasure to be found in a bounded exchange of trust and vulnerability? And this brings me to the consensual hacking social contract because this exercise is about creatively thinking through what our boundaries and desires are by designing and signing socio-technical contracts, a social and digital protocol towards a loving, secure, and mutual transgression. Now, this contract is very, very important part of this workshop, and I will highlight three parts of it. So there's many, many parts that I carefully wrote. Um, there's rules of engagement, uh, which is the part I'm gonna highlight. So there are three sections that are the primary places that a partner will fill out before doing this activity. One is what the guest is not permitted to do when inside the other's computer. The second are the boundaries inside of which the guest is free to explore, as in the literal folder paths between which a guest inside your computer is invited to explore. And the last part, which is the most important part to me, or the part that I care most about emphasizing, is what you want the guest to do when inside your computer. The reason this part is important to me is because so often consent is taught as a preventative, prohibitive, subtractive process when it is just as much an additive process about creating the conditions to access the, the most amount and the most specific kind of pleasure that you could have. So it is, it's not just about what you don't want, it's about creating the conditions to access what you do want. And when I did it um, most recently, Instead of having people paired together, because this class was not in person and I, it was online, what I did instead was a version of this exercise, which is a little bit lower risk, where I created an admin account uh, without any of my private files on it on my personal computer. And I invited all students to simultaneously SSH into my computer. So they were all inside my computer without any of my private files on it, um, all at the same time. And so that, so that was another sort of like element of this, but this formation of, the, of consensual hacking where a computer becomes, a personal computer becomes a social space, the way that a website is on a server 
that when we all go to it can be a social space, such as Twitch, for example. Um, so that social space, instead of the Twitch chat, it was like my desktop. And what I did was I invited people to create text files on my desktop of a stream of consciousness, whatever was on their mind at the moment. And people left all kinds of thoughts and feelings about what it was like. Um, and uh, one that comes to mind is someone wrote about how uh, this part of the class and also digital love languages in general made them understand their their dad more because they their dad was really into computers and always pushed them to learn computing, but they never were into it. Um, and didn't understand why, because to them computing and coding was like Apple and Google and AOL, or whatever. And they were like, why would I, why, this is not, this is not of poetry and feeling to me. But through the class, they were like, oh, this is what my dad might've been talking about or accessing like in the seventies, eighties, nineties. Um, so that's just one, one thought. And this is, this is what that looked like. So I lit a candle when we began the consensual hacking, and this is all of them on the left um, in, inside my computer, making different windows open. They opened Chrome, they left uh, text files on the desktop, they opened those text files uh, all together and also could see that screen on Zoom. And someone said, watching this exercise is really highlighting for me how often participation, participation is coerced in academic spaces and how rarely the option to refuse to consent is actually presented in those contexts. So a very important part of this exercise to me is that consent, you cannot have consent without refusal. So this exercise is 100% opt-in and at multiple points before they all sign, before people who choose to sign, they are reminded what might be coercing uh, unintentionally on my part them to participate or even on their part. Um, so yeah, this, this, this exercise completely opt in, opt out and many students have opted out in the past. And they've, uh, some of them have had amazing things to say about their decision to do that. Yeah, so that is, everything. Um, I will end it by saying, uh, by sharing this diagram again, and because it's still a puzzle that I wrestle with, of, how, of a, it's almost like a horseshoe diagram, where things that we think of as so separate can actually have so much in common. So privacy, both privacy and exposure can be a source of intimacy. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Todd, for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm really happy to be part of this. Oh, snap. I'm muted. Oh, dang. They got me again. Oh, man. I was saying some really nice stuff about uh, about Melanie, uh, uh, how inspiring they are, uh, how much I love the consensual hacking exercise. No, I, I'll, I'll repeat it. This is a classic Todd moment. Um, sorry for being silent. That was an amazing presentation. Partially, I was soliciting the audience for uh, for additional applause. Uh, but yeah, that was a, a really amazing presentation. And uh, I just was re-steering you back towards uh, the application for uh, uh, the end info page for SFPC Sex Ed, which I, I know Melanie's been hard at work at. Uh, it's going to be a really special thing happening at uh, um, in New York this summer. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much to all of you in the audience for being here. Um, really, really excited uh, for, for this next part of, uh, of the show, because usually I am 
just kind of in in host mode in uh, in Wordhack, and don't always always share my uh, my art practice or the things I've been uh, I've been creatively working on. But um, really excited to share a thing I've been working on with you today, uh, and which is called the Moon Dungeon. And uh, I think before uh, before uh, telling you about it, might as well have you uh, experience it. Uh, but before we do that, I want to briefly uh, introduce you to my collaborator on this. Uh, we've been working together on this for the whole past year. Uh, uh, this is uh, Brian Smith. Oh, and it's applauding, and now he's disappearing. Yep. Ah, there you go. <laughs> this is uh, this is Brian, not not Melanie, as the case uh, as the text below the stream. Let me change that. Here's Brian Smith. Um, uh, yeah, this uh, is, good. yeah. Here we go. Uh, this is Bryant. Hello, Bryant. Uh, hey, all. Uh, Bryant is gonna join me back on uh, on the screen to talk about Moon Dungeon in a little bit, um, but we are going to uh, to hop over there first. Uh, so yeah, let's head on over to Moon Dungeon, uh, which you can find at moondungeon.com. And, and a heads up, we're going to be hilariously restrictive here in that uh, we've really only battle tested this on Chrome with uh, Chrome on desktops. So like, it'll yell at you if you go on without Chrome. So uh, sorry if there are any Chrome haters. Um, last bit of caveat, uh, if you're on a system right now that has like a strong firewall, since there's a lot of P2P elements, it might not play nice. So just FYI, if you get in and nothing seems to be working and you're on a firewall, Sorry, it might not work for you, but for anybody on Chrome and not in a firewall, <laughs> hopefully it works great. Yep. Uh, and and with that, uh, let's get into it. Hop into uh, MoonDungeon.com here on Chrome. I see we've got uh, got some people here already. Okay, so I, I need to turn off my camera on OBS. Okay, and I'm going to refresh. Welcome, welcome. And let's see if this will work. Oh, hello. Hey. Hey there. Welcome everybody. It's me. It's me, Todd, here in in Moon Dungeon. Glad to have you with with us here. Uh, yeah, I hope you're uh, adjusting to your new bodies as uh, as trash bots. Uh, can move around with the arrow keys and. Uh, to help get around a little faster, we have this uh, handy butt thruster 9000, which you can use with the S key to kind of zoom around. Um, if you're watching on the stream, that's totally fine. You'll see my performer version. Uh, you, I see some of you have discovered the air horn sound effect, which we have uh, perhaps unwisely given to all of you. Uh, perfect. Um, yeah, so I mean, part of what we do here on uh, on uh, on Moon Dungeon is try and create that that live audience feeling, which means you can you can make a lot of noise. But I don't know. Here in Moon Dungeon, we try and save the the air horns for uh, for for special moments. So uh, so please use with some some discretion throughout. Um, hell yeah! So uh, so welcome to Moon Dungeon. Uh, so the first uh, the thing we've got to do today uh, is. Uh, We've been here on the moon for some time, uh, but our community has lost its way a little bit, and we need to seek some guidance from our elders. So we are going to awaken the three-hearted wolf and ask it a question. So already, right now, I want you to be thinking about what sort of questions you might ask an ancient wolf creature, because we're going to have a chance later. But for now, just move around, use your S key, and see if you can find the tunnel down into the wolf's lair. Uh, it'll be a little little black hole in the ground somewhere around here. And when you find it, use the D key to uh, to let us know. Oh, I'm seeing, hearing some sounds. Oh, I think I think some people have found it. Fuchsia and and green, so we can use the space bar to go into this door. Oh yeah, and now we've arrived at the staircase of introspection. 
some some questions we can ponder. Uh, ooh, how about this one? Your enemy is armed with a ball of yarn. You are armed with sorrow. What happens? So if you want to uh, shoot out a little chat box, you can press enter and there's the box in the upper right. Just make sure you click back to the main room if you want to keep moving. Awesome. Let's keep going. Oh, more questions, more things to ponder. We don't have time to introspect right now. We need to ask questions for the fate of our community. Oh, the old three-hearted wolf. We must enter through the secret portal in its stomach. Come on down here and press space on the secret portal. I'm going to gather around some of the people that are coming. Yes, down here in the stomach of the wolf. Come join me. Come on down. Hit space on this portal. Welcome. Oh yeah. Here we are. The stomach of the wolf. A strange and mysterious place. I mentioned earlier this wolf has three hearts. And we will need to awaken each one in turn, starting with this one over here on the right. This is the heart of love. Can such an old and three-hearted creature truly remember how to love? We must teach it by using our chat to type in something you love. Maybe a, a person or an animal, or maybe a, a book, a movie, a food. Things, things that you love. Oh, it's keep saying saying things you love, and we will awaken this heart. Oh no! Wait, gifts, pizza, League of Legends. My husband, grandmama. It's working. One more. happening jiggle bones it was jiggle bones that brought us over the edge amazing work everyone we've resuscitated the heart of love celebrate its magical sound oh yeah the weather yesterday these are great ones all right let's move on to our next heart this one over here come follow me This is, as some of you maybe have already detected, the heart of rhythm and music. So I'm going to need you to repeat after me on your air horn gators with the D key. Let's just uh, hit me with one time. All right, how about, hold on. All right, be quiet for a second. You listen for the pattern I make and then you're gonna have to repeat it back. about all right maybe a nice big one holding down the D key all right and the final challenge Okay, this, this yellow trash spot here on the bottom, you need to take a solo. Gather around this yellow trash spot and listen to their solo for it will awaken the heart. Yes, the chosen horn of the yellow trash spot. Yellow uh, trash bot. <laughs> the yellow yas bot. Oh, the wolf's cosmic groove. It's beginning to show itself. Finally, 
we get to the last heart. The heart of the competitor. And to reawaken this heart, we must retell a parable of Trashbot lore. The tale of Trashbot 039 and the swarm of bees. You see, Trashbot 039 was a gardener in one of the jungles underneath the moon. And Trashbot 039 used to travel around and he would get so hungry that he would reach into the beehive and snack on the little bees. Love their little honey taste. And so in this tale, I will be playing the role of Trashbot 039 and you will be playing the swarm of bees. And I'm gonna chase you, I'm gonna chase you, I'm gonna eat you, you better run away because I'm gonna get you. Oh, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you and I'm gonna eat you. You bet, oh, I'm gonna, oh, you think you're, you're getting away, but I'm here I come, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you. I'm Trashbot 039, I'm feeling pretty hungry, I'm gonna eat the bees. Ooh, wait, I'm, oh, there's some over there. Oh, I, there's a bunch hiding in this corner making burgers. Oh, I'm gonna eat you. Oh, better run. But then the bees remembered. They remembered they were able to sting. They hadn't had to do it in a while, but they remembered their stingers and they traced Trashbot 039. They traced him out of the hive and out of the jungle. Oh, and they had to run away. Oh, don't get me. Oh, no, stop. Ah, no, no, I had to run away. They had to really run all the way away. No, they were chasing him. Oh, gosh, he had to run so far away. And he had to run. And then it was enough to awaken the heart of the wolf. Oh, amazing work, everyone. The wolf is awake. And now it will be ready for our questions. Hope you've been thinking about some of those that you might like to ask. Let's go back outside and meet the wolf. Which we lost touch with the server, but I'm coming back. Here I am. Thank you for awakening me. Welcome back, Wolf. Happy to awaken, awaken you. To you young ones. What would you ask of this old wolf? All right, now is our time. We need to decide on a question to ask the wolf. Wow. What will we ask it? What is good in life? What is the origin of wisdom? Does the wolf like mudkips? Wolf, why do you sing? Where is my cheese? Is cheese better than frog? Is cheese better than frog? This is how you would spend your question. Well... There are lessons to learn from both. The cheese. With its rind and sturdiness. Comfort and sustenance for the winter ahead. Dance around the wolf. Shower it with your gifts. Keep it talking. The frog, though. With its ability to lead. To jump to new dreams.
always jump forward like the frog. I have answered your question. Now I must return to my slumbers. Listen to my mystic howl. And dance towards a future of your own making. Fifteen million three hundred and forty four thousand seven hundred and twenty nine. Enjoy the rest of work. All right, everyone, that's the message the old wolf had for us. Thank you so much. For, for helping awaken, awaken the wolf. Could not have done it without help from all of you. Alrighty, that's, uh, that's gonna be the end of this portion of, our, of showing Moon Dungeon, but uh, we've got a little presentation for you back on the WordHack stream. So hop back in over to twitch.tv slash babycastles and we're gonna present from there. Okay, wait, here I am, and maybe here Bryant is, let's see. Okay, there we go, a little Yo. smooth OBS transition. Wow, what a blast. People just really want to know about cheese and frogs, turns out. The big questions answered here on, uh, on Moon Dungeon. Getting to the heart of it. Yeah, so yeah, let's talk about Moon Dungeon. And we thought, what better place to talk about Moon Dungeon than inside of Moon Dungeon? Here we are. Got a little presentation for you in here. And uh, first, we thought we'd introduce Todd and Bryant, where we're coming at this from. So I don't know. You probably know me. I'm I'm Todd. I, I host WordHack, uh, but I, I also uh, have uh, performance as a big part of my practice from doing live digital performance uh, with hot writing, um, doing a live digital p poetry performance, and more recently with Hitchhiker as a uh, kind of like digital form of performance on the web. Um, but a lot of my work kind of deals with um, kind of like the fun and interactivity of digital platforms, but still trying to maintain that excitement and feeling of a live audience, uh, which uh, really brought me to, uh, to Moon Dungeon um, as a... Uh, as uh, another place to explore that. Um, and uh, Bryant? Yeah, uh, my name is Bryant. Um, I am a funk trombonist and web developer and Todd and I go way, way back, um, back uh, to high school marching band where we both <laughs> were in the trombone section. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been like kind of on parallel paths, uh, really interested in the intersection between technology and art uh, I feel like 
I strive to kind of be Todd's analog in music, <laughs> like best I can. That's and, a, and vice versa. <laughs> yeah. So like, I, I love, um, uh, I do like a lot of like just normal traditional live performances of funk trombonist to uh, tour around, play with artists. i um, been doing that for a really long time. And I've gotten really interested in combining that work with the web development work I do and trying to create immersive uh, electric trombone experiences. Um, you heard me at the end, kind of at the, the very end, you heard my electric trombone kind of solo. That was the wolf's howl um, <laughs> canned uh, as we, we couldn't do it live for this one. But uh, so that's, those are the types of sounds that I like to make. And I love to augment those performances um, with these interactive experiences, which uh, is really simpatico with Todd. And we were just like, well, how come we've never collaborated on anything? Um, yeah, it's after, been those like, years of like inspiring each other and saying like, oh, you did this? Oh, but I'm doing this. And then it kind of came together to uh, about a year ago where we both had kind of room in our lives to start on a new on a new project. We were just talking together a lot and thought, oh, how sick would it be to work on something together? So been working on this since, uh, I think, yeah, just like last June. Yeah, it's been a minute, actually. Um, it's obviously like a work in progress, but uh, I think we're kind of starting to find it and um, explore that space of digital embodied performances, which I think is increasingly kind of becoming a thing. Yeah, and here we yeah. have our next air quote slide of a venue <laughs> for digital performance art. Just kind of how we've been uh, been thinking about it since the the, the beginning as like a, a thing that playing that feel really feels like a space and a, a venue where experimental performances can happen. Um, and yeah, so we, we want to talk a little, you were able to probably tell some of what was going on, but we want to talk a little bit about some of the details under the hood of what makes Moon Dungeon work. Um, yeah. Do you want to start with the, the P2P layer, Bryant? Yeah. And I just, a background on like some of our motivation for this from a technical perspective and why it's laid out the way it is. Um, actually, rarely will I have spoken to a crowd where it's likely that the answer to this is true. But if you've ever like had to, or if you've ever found yourself making a collaborative experience with many, many people um, and lots of data synchronizing, uh, you know that it is not trivial. It can be really, really hard uh, to get lots of computers to play nice with each other and create like a seamless uh, shared virtual experience. Um, and so we were just really interested in knocking that out of the park in a way that we could like reuse and be able to focus on the more fun parts of making rainbow spewing wolves instead of worrying <laughs> about like P2P layers. Um, so we wanted to kind of spill the guts of how it's doing what it's doing. Um, Cause there's maybe some interesting tricks we have up our sleeve. Um, Moon Dungeon's kind of divided into, into two parts. Uh, there's a top layer that contains the players. Um, and for the most part, this is all without uh, a backend, without servers. It's all a P2P layer, which is why I was cautioning against firewalls. Um, but for those of us without firewalls, all of our computers connect directly together. There's no need for a server except for an initial handshake. And um, you can get like really low latency connections. And latency, of course, is sort of, um, or I guess high latency is one of the enemies of immersion. Um, and we were really trying to increase immersion in these performances. So P2P was kind of a natural, um, a natural go-to for us. Uh, and so we had, we had this top level app, which has these players synchronizes, you know, how they're moving, how their gadget, what gadgets they have, their colors, et cetera, all those things you'd expect to synchronize in kind of a multiplayer experience. Um, and then there is a second layer underneath the players, which is actually just an iframe containing a website. Um, all of the areas that you explore in Moon Dungeon are actually just really simple websites. Moon Dungeon is in effect kind of a browser. Um, so yeah, Todd, maybe you can sort of like demo what some of these, what some of the pages we just looked at look like. Here, here's this performance, this presentation. Uh, yeah, let's check out the surface of the moon. Uh, it's just at lobby.moondungeon.com. You can, you can hang out on the surface of the moon. It's just a website. Uh, just a website, lots of images, um, the doors, we try to keep things as analogous to actual websites as possible. The doors are just like links between different rooms that we just sort of um, wrapped around the code and turned them into something that would trigger the animations and trigger the, um, the transition between rooms. But under the hood, we're disposing of one iframe and loading up another iframe. 
and we have this uh, admittedly maybe a little bit convoluted um, API that lets the iframe talk to Moon Dungeon and vice versa. So we have this layer of players on top and websites, which we call like rooms on the bottom, which again, yeah, Todd's just scrolling through. What is this? This is a, um, mostly what you're looking at is like HTML, CSS, Canvas. Um, I think we built it in Svelte, but one doesn't have to. Um, we were really interested in this approach because I think this will kind of resonate with like the word hack ethos. Like we're all kind of mad scientists, right? We all like playing with new things. I, I get really bored when I get locked into like one particular toy. Uh, and so we were like, can we do this in a way that's stack agnostic so that you can create an area of moon dungeon in a decentralized way, not, not crypto decentralized, but in a way that doesn't require centralized hosting. Um, and we can use any stack we want. Do you like Svelte and React? Um, do you like P5? Do you like Pixie or 3JS? You could build, you want to use like some crazy API and pull in data. Do you want to use like machine learning tech? Literally anything you could put on a website, you can put in Moon Dungeon. And it's as simple as going to moondungeon.com slash room URL equals, and then you enter the URL of your site, which you can kind of see that in our glitch presentation, I think. Yeah, so right now, if you, <laughs> maybe I'll regret this, but if you want to join us <laughs> in our presentation, uh, this is where we are. Uh, and uh, that can uh, bring us to, uh, yeah, just any sort of URL. So I use Glitch a lot uh, as part of my teaching practice. Uh, and we, we have this easy to teach bullet point over over here. So it's just, if you can make a website, then you can make something on Moon Dungeon. And so making a like real-time performance experience is usually a big hurdle for someone who's like a, a an intro coding student or has like one or two classes under their belt. But if all you have to do is, is build a website and use some of the, the tools we have on here, then uh, that can really jumpstart. I've been recently teaching uh, some of this stuff to uh, to uh, theater students and kind of like they're able to really, uh, and uh, Brian actually joined for my last class at NYU and uh, they're able to really manifest a lot of their acting and directing skills inside of here. Um, yeah, it's probably one of the more fun ways to learn HTML and CSS is because like, I mean, the fundamentals of building an area in Moon Dungeon are the fundamentals of building a website with HTML and CSS. I mean, you could use more advanced things like P5, Svelte frameworks. We're doing some more of that fancy stuff here, but like people starting their first project, you could do this. Uh, you don't even need JavaScript technically. You could build something interesting with just HTML and CSS. The only caveat is you would include our API script uh, just because you know anybody familiar with iframe security, iframes uh, can't talk to their parent without um, like consent via like a post message API. So you have to include our script, um, but our script gives you a bunch of goodies. Uh, like for instance, a performer controls API, which lets you initialize all of these different controls to control things in your room. And so uh, Todd has up on the screen, um, the wolf staircase. And you can see if you're a performer, um, you have this sort of like live stream tool, which makes you the TV bot. It's not working right now because Todd is uh, his live I'm stream is over here right? on the actual camera. Yeah, <laughs> um, but normally you'd see a monitor of your performance. You can pick your devices, etc. And then we've got all of these performer controls that control. They just are. Um, they send data to and from the room, and they control aspects of the room. You can tie them up to literally anything. Um, but this is just one of those things that, like, when you're coding a performer experience, you need to build a lot of these on the fly, and it can be really annoying to get forms right, and you don't want this boilerplate to be why you don't do a cool thing you want to do. Uh, so we have a, a whole uh, UI that you can use to, or we have a whole API that you can use to declare your UI and it's super, Hello, super simple. Everyone. Um, and when this API is fully mature, it's going to handle all of the synchronicity for you. Um, so anybody who has done decentralized synchronicity you knows that <laughs> there's some really annoying problems um, that when you join uh or when you make a moon dungeon project you don't have to know anything about <laughs> that's we're 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 hoping to shield as many people as we can from the harsh realities yeah of, we've been of those challenges a big chunk of our past year working on this has been trying and failing at various approaches toward uh perfectly synchronizing the the state between all of the all of the people uh, mostly but, failing 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, so yeah, these performer controls don't uh, intrinsically control anything. It's just like a UI framework that sends numbers or um, coding code events to uh, other parts of the of the website. And I don't know, as both of us as background in performance, with Bryant with music and me with um, with poetry and, and theater, we have a lot of uh, respect for the various crew people uh, and staff of venues that can make a, a big difference in, in shows. And so like having, as being able to control things like volume and lights, like with a slider or with a um, with a, a well-proportioned, properly labeled button makes a big difference in terms of how a performance goes rather than in the past I've like had really arcane hotkey combinations or uh, had to manually enter in lines of script in the, in the past. But um, multiple people can have these performer controls open and so you can have a more elaborate performance here. Yeah, Todd and I both were actually running the performer controls simultaneously during that performance. Oh, hey, hey, look, there's some folks in. <laughs> oh, hey, <laughs> welcome. Um, what's cool about this, by the way, is that like, uh, you don't need our permission in a sense to create a moon dungeon. You need our, the only centralized part of it is currently the live stream. Uh, you need our permission and our like special API keys to run a live stream, but to create a moon dungeon world and explore it and do things uh, yourself, you literally just can enter that URL um, with uh, your website that you made, as long as you include the script um, it will just become a area in Moon Dungeon. And we actually have some hopefully not terribly written docs that we can sort of point you to, um, like what this ends up actually looking like. The API is like really turbulent because we're still like working on, um, again, once this reaches, we have a few more challenges before it reaches uh, full maturity. But like, for instance, uh, yeah, Todd, maybe you could show like the performer controls, like what it looks like, how easy it is to initialize oh, yeah. um, a performer control. Um, um, which this is down. just really nice to have it just be like a few lines of code when uh, you have to initialize this like complex form that handles synchronicity across everybody. Um, yeah. So if we want and it has, to... you know, all the, the nice features like hotkeys and things like that. I mean, I've added from scratch those quite a lot when I'm rushing to add a feature to a performance last minute and either I nix the feature because I don't have time to make the form work properly or the form is like kind of kind of janky and it harms the performance because I can't use it too good or there's a bug because forms can go really wrong as we all know. So you can just see it's as simple as like uh, the sort of like declarative JSON, um, ah, it's not declarative, but this sort of like JSON object. Uh, and if you drop that in your code, you have performer controls that can talk to uh, your, your room. Uh, currently they don't handle synchronicity for you, but the next gen, which is coming maybe in a month or two, um, will handle all the synchronicity for you. So if you like move a slider on in the performer, that slider will move for everybody or the resultant thing it's attached to is that's our that's our target for release. But if you want to play with around with unstable things, <laughs> like we invite you to check out our API and actually give it a mm -hmm. shot. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm trying to dig up uh, a uh, socket template that I have for uh, that I made for my students. Uh, on, uh, on glitch if you want to if you know no glitch and want to mess around in there um but you're welcome to do that but we are we are close to our time so i want to move us on to talk a little bit about oh yeah so some of our goals in making this was uh to get the best of live and virtual so get some of the benefits of not being limited by reality and that you can just be a a robot made of garbage and shoot gifts into the air and uh, create a cosmic wolf that uh, talks in rainbows and stuff like that. But uh, I mean, both of us, as we talked about, we really appreciate that live feeling, that low latency back and forth between the audience and the performer. Uh, real life is very low latency. <laughs> real life is extremely low latency. <laughs> Speed of light. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, just a way of being together uh, online inside of uh, uh, rather than a Zoom call, for example. And uh, I don't know, I play uh, a, a lot of online games. And uh, I think like we also kind of wanted to create some of the feeling of just like hanging out and messing around inside of an online game uh, in, yeah. in a space that was a little more explicitly dedicated towards art and performance rather than just like making numbers go up. 
Yeah, and I think this audience in particular will appreciate this because there's a, per capita a lot of performance experience among the people here. And I think anybody who's performed live in front of people, especially if they do that for a living, there is a massive delta between the feeling of doing that and the feeling of like staring at the green light on the laptop. Um, even little things like the sound of applause, um, which is why, you know, like skilled live streamers like Todd will pipe in applause sounds because when that is absent, there is something. I've seen um, a lot of musician friends who are extremely seasoned playing with really big artists and they're doing their first live streams during the pandemic and there's just they're waiting for that cushion of the applause and no applause come and they just start flop sweating like it's very difficult to be without something as simple as applause or just getting a sense of the number of people in a room you know like anybody who's played i've, I've never been to a word hack in person because i've been uh, far away geographically but playing to a small room packed has this feeling uh, that is not replicated by the number on the live stream counter. So we wanted to have bodies in space and density and have this feeling of like interacting with the crowd and seeing where they are, how they're reacting, feeding back from their energy. Um, so hopefully we're incrementing toward that. It's a work in progress, but that's sort of our target. Yep. Speaking of that incrementing, I'd like to tell you about our next performance which I think we're going to try it. We're still trying to figure out what is going to be the right performance cadence. Again, we uh, we think of Moondungeon as a venue, so we're going to, I think, try and have our own monthly show here, but we're interested in filling it with, uh, with other shows as well. So our next one, we think we're going to try and do a couple shows uh, of the same material during that week of July 25th. Uh, would love to have you join us again, uh, which you uh, can do by joining our mailing list, which you can't... Oh, holy crap, that worked. <laughs> uh, I don't man. understand why that worked actually. Amazing. But <laughs> sick. I'm glad it did. What a delight. Here I am on our mailing list uh, request form. Unfortunately, I can't meaningfully engage with it. Maybe I can check some of these. Oh, files. that's what, yeah. It, it'll pull it in, but it can't actually talk to it. That's what yeah. it is. Okay. That's so funny. That was thrilling. Uh, let me uh, get you the, the link if you would like to, to join our mailing list. Um, right now, we, we want to grab some emails from people who'd be interested in testing new uh, Moon Dungeon features, so doing test performances before we do a larger public one. Just If you're just interested in attending ones, so you can check that box. And also if you're interested in doing your own show in Moon Dungeon or just contributing to one, like being playing a bit part, like a small acting role. I, like, I feel like they're, they're, I'm very optimistic about the potential for community theater inside of Moon Dungeon. <laughs> and so would love to, uh, if someone's just interested in uh, making a small thing or playing a small role in Moon Dungeon, we want to we wanna know about you too. Like um, Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> the Moon Dungeon presents Macbeth. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so check that out. Uh, there's the, the form uh, we dropped in chat. I realize I'm dumping a lot of links in chat, so sorry about that. Um, and yeah, we... I think that brings us mostly to the end, and we can uh, take a question or two if anyone has one in the chat. Ah, that, that groove loop. All right, like we do not have any any questions in the chat. In the chat, uh, well, thank you so much, and then, uh, thank you so much to to Bryant uh, and for for joining us. And thank you, uh, yeah. Oh, how many people can join at a time? Shar asks in the chat. Yeah, we've um, load tested the thing up to a hundred, and our target is a hundred. Um, so like there is a big difference between like load testing with like bots. We actually have like AWS Lambda functions that like attack the thing with uh, puppeteer instances and things to sort of simulate players. Uh, that's not the same as real world people. Um, so would be interesting to see if it easily supports hundred real people instead of uh, bots. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, our target is to be able to do this at scale uh, for hundred people and uh, horizontally the thing can scale arbitrarily big because it's P2P so you could have I don't know, hundreds of performances simultaneously of a hundred people. Um, and if 
we're ever dealing with scales like that, we'll probably have ways of interspersing them just the way you might instance uh, a massive online multiplayer game. There might be like one performer and then several different uh, instances of crowds um, watching them. Yeah. But 100 is probably the upper bound, both from a how it looks on the screen and from a technical standpoint. Right. Yeah, in t terms of like being able to visually process 100 people on the screen is, is kind of a lot. Um, but yeah, we're hoping to, to be able to handle that number. Thanks so much. Uh, any other, other questions in the chat? Thought I wrote the word. Yeah, questions. There it is. Cool. Well, uh, yeah. Thanks for uh, for checking it out. If you're if you're interested in in Moon Dungeon in any way at all, uh, fill out that form and let us know. You can also email me at toddwords at gmail dot com. Uh, yeah. And thank you so much, Brian, for for coming on and being on Word Hack. Gonna shift over. I realized I didn't pipe in the applause sound effect on this view in OBS. So I'm going to, Bryant, wave goodbye, and then I'm going to shift over to the other view. And Oh, wait, no, here we, we can celebrate Bryant in this view with applause. I'll do, the, I'll do the Queen's wave. Oh, thank you, Bryant. Thanks for being with us. Yes, there he is. Oh, and here's me. Here's me again, solo Todd. Uh, oh, no, there it is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I need the applause, too. Feed me. I have earned it. Let's give it up one more time for all our presenters in the, uh, from tonight. We had uh, Melanie Hoff, and we had Herda Masangara, Jamie Brew, and Katie Garrow. Give it up for everyone that presented tonight. Oh, uh, yeah. And thank you so much, everyone in the chat, for helping, helping to awaken the three-hearted wolf and for supporting all these amazing presenters tonight. Um, our next word hack is, I think, going to be on uh, July 21st. I think that's gonna be uh, another online one. And then uh, I'll be announcing more soon, but we uh, do have a, uh, a venue for an in-person word hack in August to celebrate our eight year anniversary. So stay tuned for that uh, coming up in August. Um, alrighty, everybody. Thanks so much for, for joining, with, joining us and uh, I'll catch you next time.